Well, hello, everybody. I am happy to be back here for the second installment of our live stream series that we are doing here today. Um, and as you are joining me, if you want to just type your name and where you're coming from in the chat box there, we'll give you a little shout out here on the call. So today's, today's topic is a big one. Um, and I think that there's going to be a lot of folks interested in diving a little bit more in depth. We're going to be talking about how can you how can you discern what is uh, our compatibility, our true genuine compatibility? How much of what I am experiencing in this relationship is really just about my attachment system? Um, and is this truly an incurable incompatibility in this relationship, right? So altogether, I'm calling this video segment Incurably Incompatible Relationships and How to Know for Sure. So before we dive in, I also just want to draw your attention to the caption of this video. There will be a link there to an assessment that I've been working on and playing with about how to determine if what is in operation for you is primarily an attachment need versus versus a real compatibility issue between you and your partner. Um, and we've so far, we've had about 100 people respond to it and have expressed that it's been useful for them. So if that's something that is useful for you, um, after watching this video, you can check it out. And again, that's a, there's a link to that in the caption of this video. So this is really a segment for you if you're someone who has wondered about needs and values and how do my needs and my values generate conflict in my relationship and what, if any role, does, does that play in our compatibility, determining what our level of compatibility might be? And you might also have wondered, well, how do attachment styles play into all of that? So if that is something that you're interested in, today we're going to be talking about that and specifically hitting on such topics as how mismatched needs and values are not necessarily deal breakers on their own. But when you add in attachment fears, now you've got some damaging defensive communication going on and that creates its own kind of mess. Okay. We're also going to talk about how to express your needs from a more securely attached position. And I'm going to use a, a, can, a common example to illustrate that. We're going to talk about how to how emotional honesty is really the only way to expose whether there really is an attachment insecurity going on or it is just incurably incompatible. And also, how do you think about the decision? Do I stay or do I go? And how do you identify what is a real desire or need versus something that's just about defensive posturing and coping mechanisms for fear? Okay. So again, this live stream is in promotion of my live group coaching series coming up the first week in May, if uh, five days to ignite your love light. I'm going to tell you more about that at the end. But if that's something you're interested, there will also be information about that in the caption of the video as well. So I just want to give a shout out to those we've got Damon. Hello, Damon. Welcome. Thank you. And if you're just joining me, feel free to type your name and where you're coming from in the chat box there. I'd love to give you a little shout out here on the call. Um, and I will be asking for some feedback as we go through our discussion here together. So where I want to start out is looking at how do mismatched needs and values plus attachment fear equal defensive communication, right? So in every conflict in a relationship, usually within every conflict, there is going to exist um, some barometer for what, how your values are being, let's say, rubbed up against, right? What, what friction is going on? So mismatched needs and values alone do not always equal a painful incompatibility. But if you add um, attachment fear into the mix, it's almost always going to lead to a conflict that makes you think that you are incompatible. So for example, I'm going to use a very basic example here. Having an argument over socks on the floor Maybe that's not that big of a deal to, to Jack. I'm going to use a heteronormative example. Maybe it's not that big of a deal to Jack, but to Annie, it represents how she's unacknowledged or undervalued or underappreciated in the relationship because she has said several times how much it bothers her. But Jack thinks, well, you know, it's just a tiff. It's a tiff over something insignificant. We'll get over it. Meanwhile, Annie starts thinking, this is yet another example of how I am mistreated in this relationship. And Jack just doesn't care about my feelings at all. 
And so the negotiation of how they approach resolving what I'm going to call a big little fight like this can potentially shift the trajectory of the entire relationship. So let's say that Annie raises this issue with Jack in a very adversarial way, offensive way. She accuses him of being careless and thoughtless and not caring about her feelings because the socks are there yet again on the floor. And so in that moment, Annie's communicating from more of a fear-based place. And it comes across as criticizing because in her subconscious mind, his lack of care is a threat to their relationship. And anger is a feeling that we more consciously jump to when we feel threatened. And I would also have you note here that in that moment, Annie is identifying that picking socks up off the floor is an unmet need. She, think that, she thinks that is a need that she has. She thinks that's one of her values. Okay, she thinks that. I'm going to come back to that in just a moment. Now, let's assume Annie comes at Jack in that way. How do you think he's going to respond to that? Right? If someone says to you, you come home, you've had a long day at work, you take your socks off, put your feet up, and now your partner comes at you telling you that you're thoughtless, you're careless, you don't care about them, and you know, you're, you're being such a jerk. How do you think Jack's going to respond to that way of approaching him? And I'd invite you to type that there in the chat box so, so I can make sure that you're all paying attention. <laughs> uh, we have Semi Precious, welcome. We have Annette, we have Gina, we have Bill from Honolulu, great. Annette from, from Vancouver, Gina from Kentucky, expect abundance. Hello, we have Kim. Gina says Jack might see her as an egg. Yeah, yeah, right? And so he might respond as, right, not so well. I'd go for a walk. He'd feel attacked, right? So he is now on the defense. So, so now he'll respond defensively. And he might assume then, right, criticized. He might assume then that she is negating all the ways in which he does care for her, all the ways in which he does show his affection for her. And so now he starts to think, this isn't worth it. Because now he feels like she's mistreating him and undervaluing him and not acknowledging all the things that he contributes to the relationship. And so if he assumes that position, he's also going to be very likely to not want to pick up the socks off the floor because then he's going to perceive her as trying to control or emasculate him over something that he thinks is pretty insignificant. And that to him is going to feel disrespectful and unloving. And who needs that? Right. So now Jack thinks that he needs to disconnect and take space from Annie. And he feels like she doesn't value what he gives her. And we're going to come back to that, right? So now Jack thinks he needs space. Now he thinks space is a need that he has. Okay, we're going to come back to that. Now, if you've been watching me for a while or um, you're familiar with attachment styles, you might think already, oh, this sounds like the anxious avoidant trap. That's what's coming. But I, the point I want to make here today is not necessarily. Okay. So what if I told you that both Annie and Jack are actually two very secure people, but and they are perfectly compatible in every other way. They just have very different needs and or values and haven't learned how to communicate them properly. So how then would you be able to tell the difference between a secure couple that doesn't know how to communicate very well versus an insecure couple? Well, you can tell the difference if you clean up the communication and those fear-based conflicts remain. So for example, let's say that instead of coming at Jack um, in a critical way, let's say that Annie approached him with something like this, okay? Jack, and I highly recommend if you're trying to communicate to a partner that you're expressing something that's important to you, that you start by saying their name so that they, so that you get their attention, they're not distracted. And then that you also let them know the thing I'm gonna express to you is important to me. So Jack, I have something important I wanna talk to you about. And, you know, I appreciate that you work all day for me and the kids. And I know you just want to kick off your shoes and relax when you come home. But I'm noticing that socks on the floor is a recurring thing. And while I assume it's not intended to make me angry, I do feel unappreciated and unheard, unheard when I see them lying there. And it might seem small to you, but taking care of a little thing like that would be a big gesture of love and consideration for me. And I'm wondering if together we can come up with a solution or how to keep that organized and or if you might have some ideas on how to help me with that. Now, 
I realize that, you know, the way I've articulated it sounds very um, organized. It sounds very calm. It sounds, you know, very thought out and formal. You are going to say, you aren't, I don't know if you will or you won't, but I'm giving this as a suggestion. You might say something like this or try something like this, of course, in your own vernacular. But what I want to uh, demonstrate for you here is that you're coming at it from a state of appreciation. You're coming at it from a place of being open to making it a co-creative solution. You're coming at it from the position that you're not assuming that that they are trying to be inconsiderate, that they don't, you're not assuming that they don't value you, but you're opening it up to have the conversation and you are expressing how you are feeling, which may be undervalued even if that's not their intention. So you're also being curious, right? And it feels very different than the first statement that we suggested Annie might have made. And so I would ask you, and you can type that in the chat box there as well, how do you think Jack might respond to that kind of statement, right? Now, this is where we can tell if the person is secure or insecure. Okay, because a more secure response when someone approaches you like that in an open way, right, in a more emotionally honest way, in a way that's less criticizing or accusatory, but rather observant and expressive, if they respond to you, they, they can respond to you in one of two ways. And that's usually going to tell you if it's an attachment issue or a communication issue. So a more secure person, let's say Jack is a more secure person, and he might respond by saying, oh, wow. I didn't realize that it was that important to you. How long have you been holding on to that? You're right. I don't think it's that big of a deal, but now I know it's that important to you and I'm sure we can figure something out. Maybe we can put a laundry basket next to the bottom of the stairs or I can just stuff them in my shoes and take them upstairs after dinner. Would that be better? Now let's just, for the sake of argument, assume that Annie agrees with one of these solutions. And now Jack feels kind of amused <laughs> at how easy it was to please her over something so small. And so perhaps he decides to flirt with her. Wow, it's just that easy, huh? Is there any other way I might be able to make you feel appreciated tonight, right? And it becomes a playful kind of banter between them. Now, ultimately, Annie didn't really need Jack to pick socks up off the floor. What she needed was him to be willing to engage in a conversation with her about how she might start to feel more loved and appreciated. And so what she's actually valuing is his willingness to engage in that kind of dialogue and his ability to find and or co-create solutions because that makes her feel loved and supported and a part of the relationship. And so if he can respond in that way, Jack doesn't really need to take more space from Annie. He just needed to feel appreciated himself and to be given an opportunity to problem solve and contribute to the solution. And so he values her receptivity, her ability to be honest with him about how she's feeling. And that makes him feel trusted and respected. So this is a secure example. OK, now this could go a very different way. Right. This could go a very different way if he's insecure. So for individuals with insecure attachment, it doesn't matter how she approaches it. Right. So for individuals with secure attachment, they're able to kind of navigate these gray areas of emotional influence without abandoning themselves entirely, without succumbing to fears of control or rejection. He in, from a secure position, he approached it from a place of generosity and amusement even. And then he started to flirt with her. Right now, let's say that each partner approaches this point of contrast or let's say conflict between them with an attitude of appreciation and generosity, that's very different than approaching it from a position of tit for tat, right? So for those of us that have very rarely had a secure conversation, this might sound like a fantasy. This might sound like something that doesn't happen, but I assure you there are research studies that say that about 50% of the population knows how to relate to each other in this way particularly research from the Gottman Institute. And, you know, John Gottman done, has done at least 40 years worth of uh, research on real couples, long-term couples. Now, if on the other hand, let's go back to this. If on the other hand, Jack is insecure, it's likely that he's still going to respond defensively to Annie's emotional honesty. And he will probably respond in one of what I would say four ways. So he might overreact and accuse her of trying to make everything about her. He could still feel criticized and claim that she's trying to be emotionally manipulative and or controlling. 
He could passive aggressively go along with everything, whatever, just tell me what you want and I'll do it and then not do it. Or he might just walk out, stonewall, or otherwise act in a petulant manner. Fine, I guess I'll just relax in the basement from now on and then give her the cold shoulder for several days, right? So if this is your situation, then I'd have you realize that your partner really has to be doing work on themselves if they are ever gonna be able to meet you in an emotionally honest place. And it is possible, it is possible that they could, that they could. Okay, but that's really the only way in which you will be able to grow with them in the context of the relationship. Doesn't mean you can't grow on your own in the context of the relationship, but if you want to grow with them in the context of the relationship, they will have to be doing some process work on themselves so that when you approach them in an emotionally honest way, they can receive it, okay? And that's why I often feel like one of the major issues when we have insecure attachment is the ability to receive. Okay. All right. So I want to just take a, a, a acknowledge the chat box here. Now try that with an underlying thunderous emotional storm, as opposed to please pick up your dang socks. What if they think that's just a little over the top to what they're doing? They might say something like it's just socks on the floor. Yeah, that's, that was the first part. That was the first part. Um, yes, he would focus on the socks and not the attack. Right. So that's a, that's an insecure deflection, right? That's a dismissal. It's just socks. It's just socks. What do you mean? And that's a dismissal. So it's an evidence of, of an inability to show up in the relationship, being able to address the level of emotional importance that Annie is expressing. And that's why you start by saying, John, this, or Jack, this is important to me. Right. And so someone who understands, you also have an understanding that, that you're picking up on the emotional cue, right? And you don't dismiss what someone says outright. Um, uh, you're right, right. You might feel like you're trying to control them. Right. Two partners have respect for one another. Exactly. So that's what I'm demonstrating for you is when you have a secure relationship. And when you have a secure relationship, there is mutual respect, right? And you know that there are insecure attachment styles going on when that doesn't exist. When, when your partner responds in any one of those four ways that I mentioned, because when you approach somebody from a place of emotional honesty instantly, and they are insecure, instantly their defenses are going to go up and you're going to see how that plays itself out. Now, if you have an insecure partner and they're not working on themselves, that doesn't mean that you cannot still grow on your own as you continue to practice being more authentic within yourself and in the context of the relationship, even if they are insecure or non-reciprocating, okay? And as you grow, as you grow, you will become increasingly aware of what really are the true incompatib incompatibilities based on your true values and needs, as opposed to an automatic defensive demand and response disguised as needs, okay? This is important information for you, regardless of however your partner responds, okay? And the only way that you are gonna continue to glean that information is if you continue to grow up, to grow up, that's a Freudian slip, show up <laughs> from an emotionally honest place, right? Don't be banking your response on however they respond to you, right? That's not how you're gonna shift things. You rely on you. You pay attention to how you are showing up. Just they're responding defensively doesn't mean that you automatically have to armor up. You're not, you're not determining what direction you're going to go in based on what they are dealing with or not dealing with or what they're dismissing. Mm -mm, mm -mm, mm -mm. You're going to show up honoring your truth. And however they respond, that's information for you, right? And they might still frustrate you. They will frustrate you. This process will frustrate you. OK, you may even go through a period of hating them for not showing up for you, for not being able to reciprocate what you are now capable of giving. But eventually, eventually you won't take it personally anymore because you're going to realize you're going to realize that they don't know themselves well enough to show up in the ways that you now need and desire in order to expand into the deeper layers of intimacy that you you are increasingly becoming aware of because you are increasingly becoming aware of the depths of your own capacity, okay?
And the only reason that you can do that now is because you know yourself so much better than you used to. Okay. And eventually you're going to arrive at a state of compassion for their struggle without blaming them for holding you back because you realize that they could never have that kind of power over you. And you may also give up trying to educate them into catching up to you because you realize that the motivation has to come from them. And at that point, you're likely going to feel compelled to make a decision about how you want to divide up your concrete resources, your physical needs, the structure of your life, and your expanding emotional desires. You may choose to stay, but on a very real, invisible, internal level, the unspoken contract of the relationship will change for you, which means that you may come up with creative ways to satisfy those needs outside of the confines of that relationship while it remains structurally intact in the external world. You might do that. Or you might feel that these internal changes have to be reflected in your external environment. It might drive you crazy not to be able to have whatever's going on inside you reflected in your external world. And if that is the case, then you will likely feel compelled to change the nature of that relationship in very external ways for all to see. But my point here is that there's no right or wrong, that there is a myriad of solutions between either one of those decisions, right? Only the way that you qualitatively experience either scenario is what's important. And a qualitative experience of something is your internal felt experience, okay? So how do you sort out a true value and a need versus a defensive one? Okay, so this is a lot of what we're going to be talking about um, in my course, Five Days to Ignite Your Love Life. Okay, um, and we spend a lot of time using my three basic tools, which are cognitive reframing, body activation, and arts based experientials to help you think about what, what is a com real compatibility issue here versus how much is my attachment system being stimulated? How are my fears and my desires and my beliefs all interacting with each other to create these self-fulfilling prophecies that I keep falling into, right? So, so those are some things that we talk about more in uh, the course. And again, we are down to the last two days to enroll. If you're interested, more information on that in the caption of this video. Um, and as I've been developing this content, I also created an assessment. It's still in the early phases, but I've been playing with it. And I shared it with my private Facebook group and about 100 people responded to it. And they all felt it was useful in clarifying how the dimensions of compatibility in a relationship versus how much of their attachment system is weighing in on the decision, do I stay or do I go? So if you're interested, again, there's a link to that assessment in the caption of this video. You can check it out. Hopefully it gives you a little bit of insight into what might be going on in your relationship. Um, and I would love to see how you're digesting any of this um, in the captions and in the comments. If you need to go, Thank you for joining me. Otherwise, I'm going to stick around for a little while and see what we've got going on in the chat box here. Um, okay. Let's see. What if they don't validate what you're calmly communicating? Yeah, I mean, I would go back to what I just said. It's like, so they don't. That's information, though, right? Why should that affect the way that you communicate? Why should that affect the, the truth of your experience, right? Why should what they do in any way, shape, or form impact the way that you now move forward, knowing who, it is, who you are, who it is that you want to be, what it is that you want, the kind of partnership that you desire? If that is how they respond, then that's information for you. That's important information for you, especially if we're talking about what we are talking about here is if the, is this a relationship that I really want to be in because are the compatibility issues real or is it insecure attachment that's keeping us here and that's continuing to perpetuate a conflict? Like I said in the beginning, clean up the communication. If you clean up the communication and the issues remain, then you've got insecure attachment styles in wild operation, okay? If you, but if it is a secure attachment situation and the compatibility issues are not that big of a deal, clean up the communication, oftentimes the conflict resolves, 
So that's kind of the point of this film is this video is to help you discern, is this really about the socks on the floor or is this actually about something deeper? Okay. And when both people can show up in a way that they recognize what they're actually feeling and, and recognizing that whatever they're focusing on in the external environment is just a focal point for that feeling. If you can identify, okay, I'm noticing that I'm, it's making me feel this. So the thing that I'm actually needing and wanting is a recognition of this, not necessarily that. It's kind of like um, you have to start here in order to change that. Picking socks up the floor isn't going to solve the problem. It's just going to, now that energy is just going to be displaced onto, oh, but you don't wash dishes after dinner, right? It's the displacement of the energy. It's energy doesn't go away. It just finds a new point of focus, okay? So that's why it's important to recognize this part. And once you get that part recognized, now all those piddly little arguments about things that really don't matter titrate. They, they, they are not as frequent. They don't go away because that's life, but they're not as frequent and they're not as, let's say, powerful, right? Um, okay. Let's see, what if it's not as specific, like picking up someone's socks, but share information about your life, like wanting to be asked about you and hearing about their day. So there's an interesting book that you might find interesting. Uh, I just, it's a good book you might find interesting by John Gray. It's called um, Mar Venus on Fire and Mars on Ice. Um, and if you're, this is more in a heterosexual context, but he talks about how um, cisgender men and women have a certain structure in their brains and their hormones function on a certain cycle throughout the day. And so sometimes there's a lot of conflicts, conflicts that occur when, for example, um, women who work throughout the day and men who work throughout the day come home together because they have different hormonal functions and needs, how they interact with each other once they come home and what they need from each other once they come home is actually very different. And because of that, there can be a lot of clashes. So women need to replenish their oxytocin when they come home because they've been expending a lot more of their testosterone. And of course, the levels of testosterone in a cisgender male versus a cisgender woman are different, generally speaking. So a woman needs to replenish her oxytocin in order to relax. Now, a man also has been expending a lot of testosterone throughout the day. And when he comes home, it's been depleted. So what he needs to do is generate more testosterone in order to feel more comfortable within himself. So Gray talks about how men typically need 30 minutes to an hour when they come home of doing nothing and zoning out in order to replenish that. Whereas women, in order to replenish the hormone they need, which is oxytocin, need to do, th need to do activities that foster the generation of oxytocin, which is bonding activities like talking, <laughs> talking a lot sitting on the couch together, touching, rubbing, doing things that are nurturing. Um, so they need kind of different things in that moment and how well those things are met at this sort of crucial point throughout the day for most people in their everyday lives when they both come home from work can generate lots of conflict if it isn't acknowledged. Um, so for anyone who has questions like that, you know, it is a gender-based book. John Gray can be kind of a um, controversial figure in that respect. But if you're someone who um, is interested in that kind of approach, it's worthwhile reading the information. Uh, but I, again, I don't, I don't ascribe to that as doctrine. Um, also, because there's research that shows that like 20% of men have female brains and 20% of women have male brains. And if you look at a lot of the research, you'll actually find that within subjects, you'll find greater differences than between subjects, which is to say, if you are to compare a group of men's brains versus to a group of women's brains, you'll actually find less um, differences than if you were to take than if you were to just take a look at a group of women's brains and look at the variances between each of those brains. So, so don't take this as gospel. Okay. But it is something that there has been some research done on that. And, um, it's interesting to read if you are heterosexual, um, that might apply to your situation. So it's worthwhile checking out. Um, To be so much better and how I showed up before my brain injuries and dealing with very confrontational partner. My ex-husband was more of a whatever, tell me. Yeah. 
Well, brain injuries are a real thing. I mean, that has a very, that can have a significant impact on, um, on, on personality even, you know, um, I used to work for Dr. Eamon, who is, uh, kind of like a celebrity doctor. He has a show on PBS, um, called lying on the psychiatrist couch. Before that, he had a show called change your brain, change your life. He's written a couple of bestselling books, um, about the brain. And he also wrote a book about, um, the power of the power of the female brain, and um, he also wrote a book about the brain and love. And those, if, if that's something that intrigues you, I recommend checking them out. It's pretty interesting. So can we stay together to be together when there's no growth from one side? Sure, sure. And that's what I, that's what I mean, like what I said towards the end, is that growth is always possible in or outside of relationship. But it's, it's possible when you allow for it. Right. So if so, if you're in a relationship and and you're like, you know what, I'm attached to this person. And because of all the time I've put in, my life is now constructed around them. That does happen. You know, I the the con, the contract between you is a legal one, but maybe it's also become one where your routines and the way that you move through the world is now structured in large part around this other person. So what I'm saying is. Maybe that's a commitment that you've made because it's a value that you have. Okay, so find another way to continue to grow. And so that means on some level, you got to let go of the idea that, that that structure, that contract is the vehicle through which you are experience growth. They're telling you it isn't and you can't control them. But what you can control is your own inner life and experience. So you might find other ways, other avenues within the context of that relationship. Right. And may, but, but within that context, but it may not be the relationship that you are actually, let's say, sourcing your growth food from. Right. You'll find other ways to find it and you decide what that is. I'm not one of those people, I, I, I'm not one of those relationship coaches who's going to tell you that lifelong monogamy is the only way to have a lifelong committed relationship. <laughs> Uh, you know, that's just one thing, though. I also am someone who believes that you can have an, a, an exchange of erotic energy without having sex. So but you may develop intimate relationships that are expressed that intimacy is expressed in other ways. Right. And you just make choices about how you want you the expansion of your internal life and the things in this world that you find nourishing to your soul and to your mental, emotional and spiritual expansion. You make choices about what that's going to look like in the world of physical form, because I believe we are spiritual beings having a physical experience. And so you get to decide what is that? Ex what are the exchanges of energy going to be for you? And how is that going to look in the world of physical form? We grow up with a lot of conditioning that tells us it's going to look like this. Right. When you love someone, that means that that means that you behave this way. You do this kind of thing. You give that kind of stuff and you commit that amount of time. But who says? Who says? Who says? Why? Why does it have to be that way? You can decide. You can decide what it is between you and your partner. You know, and it's, it's interesting. Uh, the Kinsey Institute did studies on this that show that sometimes when married couples open the relationship, they actually experience an increased attraction to each other. Um, of course, the other happen. The other thing happens too. One per they, they they grow apart. Um, but you know, I, we don't often hear about the research on that because it's still a taboo thing, and people don't like talking about it openly. Um, but but that's just one scenario. You could also be monogamous to someone in a lifelong relationship, but you're finding your intimacies elsewhere. You're building relationships and experiencing exchanges, energetic exchange, exchanges that are by nature intimate, and you're feeling satisfied and filled up with that. But you are technically in a monogamous long-term relationship, and you've never broken that vow. But what, but what we might not be willing to acknowledge openly is that once when that happens, that there's something in the unspoken contract between you and your partner that has shifted, that has changed doesn't make it good or bad or whatever. It just has. And that's okay. It can be. So I do believe that you can grow 
remaining in the external contract construct of a relationship. If you want your external world to look the way it looks, that's fine. But I'm just suggesting that doesn't mean you have to abandon whatever internal growth is possible for you. And that there is a myriad of possibilities for you to find those intimacy and spiritually spiritual growth needs met. Right. However, of course, for some people that might work. For others, that's going to feel impossible. That's going to feel like I can't. I can't live that way. I'm going to feel, you know, compartmentalized. I'm going to feel split. I'm. I need my external world to represent my internal world. I need it to. And if I and if it can't, then I feel that I'm somehow living a less than life. It's a temperamental thing, if you ask me. There's no right or wrong way. But if that is what you have come to discover about yourself then you know, you're really not going to feel fulfilled until you honor what you know about yourself and recognize that even if that means that there's a change in your external circumstance or the legal contract of your relationship, it's not wrong. It's not shameful. It's just you got to honor yourself in that. And there will be solutions to, and that doesn't actually your attachment relationship. It just means the way it looks has to change. For you, in order to you feel, in order for you to feel like you're living your best life, right? Okay. Um, is it possible to keep a monogamous relationship and make it feel exciting and healthy like it did in the beginning over time? Yes, I believe it is. I think that has more to do with polarity, um, and and I think that polarity exists in any relationship configuration, heterosexual, homosexual relationships, gender fluid relationships. I think that absolutely that's possible as long as you are playing with polarity. So, you know, polarity is traditionally it's been spoken about in terms of masculine and feminine energy. I think those are the words that we use because historically that's how we've been conditioned. But we're entering into a really interesting phase of human development where that box is breaking down um, and becoming more flexible and fluid. And with that, we're ha we have a lot more permission to step into whatever polarity we feel inclined towards. So, so, and I think this works in partnership, regardless of what your gender expression or orientation may be, partners play with holding a polarity. So instead of talking about it in terms of masculine and feminine energy, we might talk about it in terms of I'm going to I'm going to reference a coach that I love who talks about this. Her name is London Winters. Um, and she talks about changing the language so that it's palatable to, I, I would say, a more current situation. And that is the alpha and the alpha. So being able to play with directed, structured, containing energy and externally oriented energy. And then there's the energy that is expressive and organic and fluid and uncontained, right? And so there are these two polarities. And hi historically, I think women have con been conditioned that they need to hold the omega. And there may be some hormonal influence on that. And men have been conditioned to hold the, uh, the alpha. And there have been some hormonal influences around that. But the body, we know, responds to the environment as much as it does to its own genetic inheritance. So how much of that is really about social conditioning that has you know, influenced our bodies to function in a certain way. We don't know. It's, be, it's becoming increasingly um, uh, intriguing area of research. But all of that is to say, if you can feel that, but usually we will find ourselves comfortably suited, seated in one or the other. So let's say that you have, um, let's say you have a partner who m more, more enjoys and feels comfortable seated in an alpha state. So someone who feels more comfortable when they're directed, when they're containing, when they are decisive, when they feel more structured in something, right? Um, so we know that that's a state that they feel more comfortable in. And let's say that you as a partner, you observe them to be experiencing a state of confusion and you experience them to be feeling ambivalent or diffuse or like, you know, they're, they're not, um, they're starting to inhabit, let's say, omega energy, but in a, a shadow aspect of the omega energy, right? Because each of these polarities will have a light and a shadow side to them. So in order to help, this might attachment theory, we'd call this co-regulation, maybe, or some form of attunement. But you might 
as the partner, you might assume if they're starting to slip into more shadow omega, then you might compensate by by inhabiting more of your light omega. And when you start inhabiting more of your light omega, it's going to it's going to polarize them to step into their alpha more so. So they start feeling more comfortable. So like they're confused. I can't make a decision. I don't know what to do with this. And you're, you're kind of like, oh, well, maybe I'll be more confused than them. And then that forces them to, to make a decision. And now they're feeling more comfortable. Right. Um, but we have we tend to do the opposite. And that causes problems. So like you, maybe you have a partner who likes to hang out in the alpha more often, but now they start to feel confused. Now this partner feels, oh, well, they're starting to lose their containment and their direction. That means I have to step in and I have to be more directed and I have to take charge here. I have to take control, right? But then that's only going to make this person feel, descend more into a polarity that they're uncomfortable with. Right. And then they're going to leave the situation because now they don't feel good about themselves in the situation and now they don't feel safe. And then they look at you as being an impetus for that. So rather than doing that, you you just sort of expand more into, oh, no, <laughs> I'm going to do more of this. And then they get polarized in the other direction. I'm not sure if that helps. Um, it's not my area of expertise to talk about this so in depth. But it's something that I am um, circling around in terms of the way I think about these things. So I thought I would share it kind of um, just as a thought bubble in case it's something that rings true for you. If that is something that you want to learn more about, I recommend checking out the work of London Winters. Um, also, there's another coach. Her name is Alana Pratt. I, and she talks about she coaches men and women around this kind of stuff. Um, she she has a program called like Noble Badass for Men, and uh, she has another program for women. Um, so if that's something that intrigues you, I recommend checking that out because it's another framework for looking at, you know, it's another framework for looking at how do we sustain polarity in relationship. Also, you know, tantric practices talk a lot about how to sustain a balance in order for there to be lifelong passion, let's say, and arousal in a relationship. Um, I struggle with feeling rejected, but can't move past that. What I can't move past is boredom. If I'm more entertained while being alone than being with another person, I've got to go. I would probably have to ask more questions about that. The other, the other thing about, um, the other thing about boredom is boredom is usually a smoke screen. You know, boredom is usually a smokescreen. I'm bored. Well, if you're bored, then you're looking to something outside of yourself to entertain you, to, to enliven you. You're looking for some, you're trying, looking to source something from the external environment. And that's a misallocation of where your excitement actually comes from. Excited feelings come from you. So, so, you know, I'm, boredom can also function defensively, right? Um, what do you feel about what Esther Perel says about keeping spice? I don't actually, I've never read Esther Perel. I know who she is. I've watched a couple of YouTube videos, but I don't, she says a lot of things <laughs> about long-term relationships. So you'd have to be a little more specific. Alana Winters, A-L-A-N-A -A -A, Winters. Um, she, I, I think she's a fascinating person. She, in re, she has a book called, oh, I'm not going to remember it. Um, sacred, I think it's sex, sacred sexuality for the enlightened woman or something like life. Some, just look up London Winters. Um, but she she uh, spent a lot of relations, and then she met someone I think it was like ten years her junior, um, and they it sounded like had a quasi anxious avoidant trap relationship in the beginning, and then it evolved, and then they got married, and they've been married for several years now, and they work together teaching people about these types of things um, and how to sustain long lasting, healthy monogamous relationships. And they wrote a book together um, about this, which I found very inspiring. So I highly recommend, you know, Google London Winters. It's, I like the way she talks about things. Um, can someone develop an insecure attachment style in their teenage years as a result of a breakup? Yes, actually, um, research shows that you can develop insecure attachment in adulthood, especially if you've had a significant 
situation. It could be a significant, you know, attachment relationship um, dissolving. It could actually, it could also be the result of like a natural disaster, or it could be the result of uh, someone dying unexpectedly or, um, it can also happen if you ha get into a relationship with someone who has a lot of momentum tied up in whatever their insecurity might be. They can kind of drive you toward towards being more insecure. I talk more about this in a video I'm going to release next month. Um, it's going to be called, uh, how can I tell if my partner is secure or avoidant? I think it was a question that was raised similar to this. But I talk about how when, because these things exist dimensionally, um, we can, so, so let's say you have, you're in a relationship with, let's say you're in a relation, let's say that you are someone who's more avoidant. Okay. And you get in a relationship with someone who's more secure, but because you are avoidant, you're hypersensitive to any emotionally honest communications or any bids for contact, any bids for contact, right? Even bids for contact that you would experience in the normal course of a relationship, you're hypersensitive to it. I, that's what makes you avoidant. So someone who is secure, who makes, let's say, a proportional, proportionately reasonable request for contact, you hyper respond by withdrawing kind of inexplicably, or you have a hyper defensive response to it because you're hypersensitive to bids for contact. So now you create in the more secure person a question, right? Like, oh, I wonder why they're responding that way because they're secure because people haven't responded to them like that. <laughs> they're secure because their environments have fostered a more secure attachment. But when you start responding in a way that's insecure, now they're sort of naive to that in, in a way. Like they're a bit naive. Um, and, you know, everyone talks about being secure as the holy grail. Well, let's be honest. If you're secure, if you're secure, you're also probably a bit naive unless you're earned secure right? You are that way because you haven't encountered difficult things in your life. I mean, let's be honest. This is why I say that when we struggle with insecure attachment, I actually feel like when you have great struggle, you have great calling because think about it. You, I mean, if you're struggling with insecure attachment, you also have a knowledge of things that, you know, maybe you're trying to become more earned secure, but don't discount the things you know. Don't discount the things you know. Yes, sometimes we create the situations we fear, but you know that's because you were, did have exposure to them at one time, right? So let's not complete discount our experience, right? So, so just, but what can happen is because now we're in a new context, but our brain is still functioning on a survival brain that we had to experience in previous relationships, right? So we, we have a hard time adjusting to a new circumstance and we take everything we learned in an old circumstance and we apply it to a new circumstance without considering whether or not it's actually applicable. So now we enter into this new circumstance, perhaps with a partner that is secure, but we are coming to it with all this, you know, knowledge and from, from a previous one. And we're assuming that's going to be applicable here. And in that assumption, we generate, we generate the circumstance that now depending on how much momentum you have around it, you may start to create and like sort of hand over that insecurity to them by osmosis. And they may, if they are naive enough, they may take it in and be swayed by your momentum. And now they become more insecure. Now the opposite works too, though. They may be someone who's more secure, but they have a stronger sense of self and groundedness in their position. And maybe they are not so naive and they see what you're doing and they're just like, mm -mm, nope, not going to play that game. And so now you have a choice to step into a new context and move towards a more secure position or not, maybe you're not ready. I think it's gonna be different for everyone. But you know, it depends on, I think it depends on your energetic momentum, the, the level of life force energy that you walk around with, if you ask me. Okay. Um, if you've seen it's much more rewarding to even have a normal good life. Yeah, I mean, I think that's the other the other benefit too. Um, Dr. Halpern in his book, How to Get Over Your Addiction to a Person, I think it is. He, he, he had a quote, I'm gonna botch the quote, but um, it just stuck with me. He said that, that relationships with, that 
relation that that attachment's not necessarily a bad thing, especially if you are are compatible and 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 you do experience uh, the relationship as positive, um, and that individuals who've struggled with insecure attachment actually can have even more than secure people can have a deeper appreciation of a secure partner um, once you know once they're ready for it like once they're ready and able and can and and, and are, are open to receiving what the secure partner offers because they have finally reached that place where I'm done with this drama game done 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 right it's done 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 for me right <laughs> So when they finally reach that threshold and they meet someone who can who can meet them on the level that they're at, they're not worried about being bored anymore. They're not worried about the challenge. They're not worried about that kind of stimulation because they are done with that game over it. Right. So once they reach that point and they find a secure person, they can actually be a fiercely loyal and very committed and very appreciative partner because they have had the exposure to the other side because they know what it is to not have that so well, right? It's an experiential learning. Um, so, so there is, a, you know, a power, a powerful quality that partners with, with let's say, earned secure attachment can bring to a relationship, right? Um, I, after being polarized by an avoidant, once you feel good in a two feet in relationship, it is amaze, amaze, amaze bazookas. <laughs> I love that. I'm going to add that to my vocabulary. <laughs> so um, can you list and explain top needs that might be in conflict? Um, so I have a link to an assessment in the caption of this video, which will talk about them. There's 12 dimensions that I mention or that I, I have you consider. So those are sexual chemistry domesticity, right? How do you both want to contribute to the day-to-day -day routines and functions of the home? Cultural influences, is culture a big part of the relationship? Um, what are your future goals? Like, how do you see yourselves in the future? What are your intimacy needs? That's basically emotional closeness, like emotional proximity. What do you like to do for entertainment and fun? Like, how do you play together? Affection, and of course, physical affection is different than, than sexual contact. Um, intellectualism. So how much do you both like talking about ideas versus just issues, mundane issues of the day to day, right? How much do you need that? Also generosity. So is there a willingness to be generous in the relationship towards one another without feeling depleted, manipulated, or like you're being taken advantage of? Also, what's the role of humor in the relationship? What is the importance of humor in being able to laugh with your partner? And lastly, I would say spirituality. You know, what role does spiritual meaning and beliefs come into play uh, in your relationship? Um, and, oh, one more, and that is unconditional regard. So unconditional regard is when Imagine that you're not in a relationship with this person, right? So it's an appreciation for them because you believe in who and what they are. You deeply respect them for what they've accomplished. And you just like being around them because you believe that just by being who they are, they contribute to the good of mankind, right? You just think they're such a stellar person, independent of how they respond to you or how they show up in the relationship. That has to do with um, unconditional regard. How much of that do you actually have for your partner, <laughs> independent of being in relationship with them, right? Um, so, yes. So we, we're at about an hour, so I think uh, it may be about time to hop off. But I want to say thank you to everybody that has participated here in the call. I appreciate you joining me here today. And tomorrow we will be back with another live stream, same time, 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And again, in the caption of the video, I have a link to help you look at, assess to an assessment to help you look at compatibility versus attachment um, uh, impulses, and also a link to the live group coaching series if that's something that you are interested in. So thank you so much for joining me here today. And I hope to see you again here tomorrow.